Welcome to Baseball Card Illustrated, the show about our national pastime illustrated with baseball cards. I'm Bronco, the PSA 11. And I'm Kevin, who's, I think both of my shoulders are now switched. Right is left and left is right. And this is 1986 Tops. So, first of all, I feel terrible because we have missed out on a chance to win a trip to 1987 Spring Training. <laughs> hey, 1987 Spring Training, bet on the Twins. <laughs> And maybe the Cardinals as well. And the Cardinals. Yeah, now if you're an 86, you, you didn't have to have me from the future to tell you to bet on the Mets. They were absolutely incredible. But this is this is some vintage, vintage stuff for a couple of different reasons. Uh, and, and mostly it's about the, the writing, the, the actual design, the writing on these. This is as classic as it gets. First card out's a checklist, right? And... The upper writing looks like something from that, that uh, Disney World restaurant that's supposed to be futuristic, but is actually <laughs> from the 70s, like Space Mountain looking writing. And then everything in here is italicized. Everything's in italics. Even on the back of the card, everything is in italics. <laughs> so uh, thank you, Tops, for getting us a little bit of uh, wax stain on the checklist. That's the best thing you've done yet. And of course, we got the gum stain here on Ooh. the Keith Moreland card. So. So you, you cannot miss 1986 tops. There is nothing on earth like 1986 tops. By the way, your, um, your wax stain or your gum stain came through to the front. I was going to say, that does happen. Brett Butler, now a uh, Cleveland Indian, was an Atlanta Brave. The Braves traded Brett Butler and Brooke Jacoby, who was a good player, and a guy named Rick Behenna for Len Barker. By 1986, Butler is an all-star player for the Indians, and Len Barker is watching the All-Star Game from his living room. These are cut very well, as you can see from this <laughs> particular card. Woo, it's, as, as Roger Craig checks out his one of his pitchers. <laughs> Roger's like, I turned this guy into a, into a playoff team. I turned a bunch of Jim Gotts into a playoff team in 1987. So this is quintessential, just incredible. The, the sort of Mexican restaurant font at the, at the top, it's in huge, like Giants is appropriate because it's giant letters. <laughs> giants! And, you know, just everything else. This is, this is so 80s. It's so great. Jerry and Aaron, been in the game his whole life and still still doing stuff in the game. But he was a catcher and first baseman at this time. I say, and watching the game, he was getting good preparation right there in that particular photo. Is he sitting on a bucket? I think he might be. Baseball players thing. There's a name for you. So, and, and Joaquin Andujar here is coming off an 85 season where he started Game 7 of the World Series and got ejected. <laughs> and I think destroyed a toilet in Kansas City that, that when he got ejected. It's it's a pretty legendary thing. I was going to say, like I think everybody remembers Roger Clemens getting thrown out of a playoff game. And maybe this one isn't quite as well remembered. But definitely, definitely heated. Uh, I, had a, I had a buddy who called him walking underwear. You know who was not heated? Billy Hatcher. He looks like <laughs> the coolest guy in the room right there. Nothing is going to bother him. Not even the Cubs in 1986. <laughs> right? he, I may be wearing his Cubs jersey now, but in four years I'll be a World Series MVP. <laughs> with Better the days Reds. are coming. <laughs> yeah. He's just biding his time. Good for him. Hey, Randy Bush. He's been a... Baseball card illustrated staple in a couple of different series. I was say, I don't have the time to sit there and mark down every single player we've gotten, but he's got to be on that list. Walt Terrell's going to be on that list. Ruben Sierra's on that list oh, of guys yeah. who we pulled a lot of cards from. Multiples, for sure. The, see, here is the, it's the so bad it's good thing, right? Because this card design is clearly just, it's bad. I mean, it's a bad design. But you've got that beautiful powder blue uniform in there. This is one of those things that, it's, uh, it could be so bad it's good. Or it could be so bad it's bad. It's just bad all over again, <laughs> which is a thing. Bobby I'm just going to leave that card there. If don't, you wanna... don't be cruel. Okay, there we go. Don't be cruel. Uh, <laughs> the truth about Roni. Okay, we're on. Randy, <laughs> Randy St. Clair, uh, in the Expos of, uh, of that time frame. But that I don't think is at the Expo Stadium because that looks outdoors. Here is a guy... Once in a while this happens, I've never heard of this guy, but he played several years in big leagues. If I remember right, Chris Berman called him Jeff Lottie Da. I believe that's right. I don't know if that he, is. He'd probably call him Jeff Latte nowadays. Oh, yeah. He'd, yeah, he'd miss the name three times, right? <laughs> it's funny, too, how now this the, the gigantic letters can't be the same thing for Cardinals because you have to fit that into a <laughs> tighter space. There. 
you know, it's that it's that font that, that gets smaller as it goes. What, what would like Arizona Diamondbacks cards oh, look like? Oh, tiny, <laughs> tiny little things. <laughs> There'd be like a couple rows of letters. <laughs> Um, for those of you curious about the back of these cards and what they look like, we'll let you do that and take a look at his stats as well. The first brother pitching duo in Cardinals history, Grover and Lou Loudermilk in 1911. Boy, when you started that, I was going to say there was another latte. There were a lot of lotties. <laughs> but no, you went to something from the turn of the century. Yep. He had a 184 ERA in 1985. He was He was good. This guy was pretty decent, too. He was. That's another dude that I swear... We're going to turn on, if there's a 2020 season, we're going to turn on turn it on, and John Candelaria is going to pitch the seventh inning in relief as a one-out lefty guy, or I guess a, a three-batter lefty guy in the new rules, but he was around forever. He was on the Pirates when they were a World Series team in the 70s. Now, we've noticed things on cards throughout the course of what we've opened here on Baseball Card Illustrated. Apparently, 1986 Tops was the year of just sitting out there and hanging out. Yes. They, the the Tops guy I'm picturing missed a whole bunch of guys, so he just went right before the game. It's like everybody's sitting down. He's like, hey, snap, 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 snap. It's, it's the action pose, the new action pose. Okay, I misread this at first. I'm thinking a couple things. First of all, when did Steve Sachs ever play for the Red Sox? <laughs> and when was he ever a catcher? <laughs> nope, this is Dave Sachs. <laughs> At some point, they got him a helmet that fit, but not here. Uh, that's that's something. Rich Gedman and Dave Sachs. That's a name. Probably should have looked at what he had done in his career here. He played in 22 games for the Red Sox in 1985. Played in two games for your 1982 Dodgers and seven for the 83 Dodgers. So, so there were two Saxes on that team then? I guess so. Huh. Dave and Steve. You know what they use to call each other? What's that? The saxophone. Hey! Hey, Mike Jones, how you doing? Mike Jones. Who? Mike Jones. <laughs> Who? Sorry. Little crossover hip-hop reference there. Let's see, uh, was he, he was, in fact, a part of the World Series champion Royals. We'll throw those stats up there as well for 1985, you. 1985. 64 innings pitched. He was, uh, yeah. He, you know, he was there. He was on the team. He's got a World Series ring. And there's Gary Matthews to wrap up pack number one. Look at the Sarge. And the Sarge, that is, the funny thing about that is that's the Sarge in literally every situation. I don't think I've ever seen a card of him that doesn't look exactly like that. So he's, he was at home in 1986 tops then. Yeah. Just sitting there hanging out. <laughs> Brick behind him just doing his thing. He's a, a commentator now, TV commentator for the Phillies. And uh, whenever the Phillies come to Milwaukee, he and Euchre spend... A long time trading little jabs back and forth. Those two have a fun little thing going. That, that doesn't sound like anything you could do at no, all. No, no. You, <laughs> you know what? I, I could stand, I read, read a tweet about this. I could stand to hear Bob Euchre just talk. Not about what's happening in the world today, just to talk. I was going to say, there's a couple guys I would put on that list. I love Norm McDonald's voice. I think oh. he could make reading the phone book funny. Yeah. Euchre's voice could make reading the phone book enjoyable. <laughs> and there's a few other guys like that, too. Um, the guy that played... Um, the manager in Major League. I loved his voice. <laughs> uh, I think it's, is it James Gammon? Is that his name? Is that his name? The actor. <laughs> um, there's, there's a couple of them out there, and he's one of them. <laughs> so there you go. Anyway, that is pack number one of 1986 Tops. Give him the heater, Ricky. Thank you for watching the Baseball Card Illustrated channel. Last week on The Big Show, we had a special episode because of the 30 for 30 long gone summer regarding the great home run chase of 1998. Specifically, we touched on whether Big Mac actually hit 71 homers that year. We invite you to check out our other videos here on the channel that the Diamond King and I have made. We appreciate you taking the time to view these and invite you to comment and subscribe to the channel. Now, back to 1986 Tops. 1986 continues here with a look at Tops, the real one. <laughs> they were they were the only one in 1986. Uh, there was Fleer and Donruss at this time, but Tops was still the really the reigning king. But they, that star was starting to fade a little bit with the very black and white issue of 1986. And there we go with our leadoff hitter in Pack Two. So I, I would say the same thing that I said before in Pack One. This is. If you talk about the ugliest card design of the 80s, this might be it. But there's something about those great uniforms that offsets it. Like, it, 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 some, it's aesthetically pleasing. 
the uh, the powder blue road jerseys. I'm gonna say I would argue maybe something from the early '80s might have been uglier, but '81 was bad. It's kind of like I love '84, love '85, like '87 a lot. '88's okay. '89 is okay. Yeah. And somehow this got mixed in with that. Yeah, this is a, a huge departure. This is a concept album by a band that just went pretty wrong. I gotta but say, it, and look, look what we have here with the A's. 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 <laughs> that's like, that's the size of like one of those little coins or those you know minis. You could just put the word A's and no picture on there. Like, couldn't they have figured out a way to put athletics on there? Yeah, of course. Then, then it squeezes in as we saw. But again. The design it just like hurts your eyes, but those jerseys are great. Or you could have put the Metropolitans. <laughs> Had it like wrap around the card. So we were talking about this off camera, and you know you always like to refer to things that you didn't say that anyone ever heard. But we got the Mets here, and I think it's only appropriate when talking about the Mets to work a little bit of Omar Minaya in. <laughs> Omar Minaya didn't sign Doug Sisk, but if he was in a position to, he probably would have. So we got Roger Craig up here. I'm going to clear the deck. Another of my favorite managers from back in the day. Oh, yeah. Sparky Anderson. Sparky Anderson. So I, I always pictured that as a kid in this era, between Sparky Anderson in baseball and Marv Levy in football, <laughs> I just pictured that every manager on the face of the earth was that. Like Sparky is, I mean, that's a great shot of him right there. Just that wonderful smile. But if I guess he always looked so friendly. Right? But if he's angry... <laughs> Like, he's ripping somebody up. Earl Weaver, mm -hmm. you know, like those. You just don't have it anymore. You have good managers in baseball today, but you don't have the fiery passion. You yeah, know, the that, memorable guys yeah. where you can click on videos of them. You know, your Lloyd McClendons would follow in later years. Lou Pinella, obviously, and there's a bunch of others. But, yeah, Tiger, or, uh, Sparky Anderson always seemed like just a friendly old guy, you know, like your grandfather or something, and... And he managed two of the best teams in the, the last, let's say, 50 years. Mm -hmm. the, the Reds, the Big Red Machine, and then the 84 Tigers team that uh, was basically a wire-to-wire -wire champion. Now, you mentioned those two teams. I'll, we'll finish up our Sparky Anderson conversation with this. Do you remember the show WKRP in Cincinnati? Oh, absolutely. He was a guest star on that. Okay. And he was also in the movie Tiger Town, which I think we actually referred to on one of our first editions of Baseball Card Illustrated. You're going back to my early, early <laughs> years there. That's way back. There's Dwight Evans. Dwight Evans. So the thing about Dwight Evans is he's he might have just gotten out of bed here, but he's still going to hit 280 with 25 <laughs> home runs. I'm still kind of floored that he played center field. Yeah, you, know, you think of him as a right fielder. Yeah, but he did play center field, and it was. was like he it, just never struck me as the most athletic guy on in baseball. Right. And usually to be a center fielder, he's your most athletic outfielder. Dwight Evans. But, Good career numbers by that point because he'd been around a while. I'm gonna say never really a base stealer either, which you know sometimes you kind of throw into that whole conversation about speed, whether that's a true assessment of it or not. But oh. we got an A's leader. Now you're hitting one not of my an favorite. A, not A leader, an A's A's leaders. leaders, yeah. This is one of my favorite designs in the 86 set because everything else about this set, like I said, it just it's painful, right? The, the design just slaps you upside the head. This is a dream sequence. Like, <laughs> doodly -doo, doodly -doo, doodly -doo. there's Dwayne Murphy hitting for the A's. You know, like that's what that looks like to me. Now, if this is truly a dream sequence, they would have had, like, Jose Canseco or Mark McGuire, like, things, good things to come for the, future, for the next yeah. couple of years. Hang around, A's fans. It's going to get better. Chris Cotteroli led the 85 A's in innings, wins, and strikeouts with 111. And there. And that's that. Th there you need to know everything about the, the Oakland A's, A's of that time. Yeah. Jerry Kuzman, that's another name that... You're thinking, like, he was still around in 1986? Jerry Kuzman, here's how far back Jerry Kuzman goes. Nolan Ryan shares his rookie card with Jerry Kuzman, 1968. Or does Jerry Kuzman share sure. a rookie card with, with Nolan, Nolan Ryan? Ryan? That you should go in and, and ask a, a card dealer sometime, do you have a Jerry Kuzman rookie <laughs> card? I need that to complete my set. I don't know why it's so expensive. Are you speaking, of guys, Ray? speaking of guys that shared a card, here's Barry Bonds. Yes. <laughs> so the the joke is 1987 Donruss opening day, uh, the Johnny Ray card. Wait, it was the Barry Bonds card had a picture of Johnny Ray. Yeah, correct. And and so they, you know, Johnny Ray as Barry Bonds. As Barry Bonds. Now clearly, 
that's not the case in, in this photo. <laughs> and if they'd waited, say, 10 or 15 years, then there definitely would have been a huge difference between Johnny Ray, who was a scrawny second baseman, and Barry Bonds, who uh, uh, grew quite a bit in his career. <laughs> and with that, we move on to Jason Thompson. Here's, here's another one. What a great... You've got that yellow helmet, that Pirates helmet with the black bill on it, that gray jersey. I mean, these are... Honestly, in the mid-'80s, the jerseys were great, and the cards were just... Ugh. <laughs> can, can you spell that? Yeah, I have to get a Google translation on that one. Now, there wow. is a person that played baseball. You can't say Hall of Famer. Nope. But and, he's and probably, a person that played baseball and so, managed. And, and, and actually, on this card, it says first baseman manager. There's a lot of kids that you will probably never see again here. Uh, Rose had just broken the all-time hit record. I think this is card one in the set. Am I wrong? Yeah, it's card number one in the set because Pete Rose had just broken the record. So there's all these Pete Rose subset cards in this set. But, I mean, Pete was an old man at this point. He was managing and playing and betting apparently and uh <laughs> this is but but that is the center of baseball in this moment pete rose now we go from that to a 1971 copy of <laughs> of uh mike fishling this guy yeah how do you how do you make your 86 cards more attractive you turned them into 1971 i like that so much better i was gonna say i i when we first talked about doing 1986 tops this was the first thing that kind of came to mind like you know you're going to come across your Mike Fishlands and your who are some of the other guys we've had here, here. Doug yep. Sisk and uh, Donnie Hills <laughs> like maybe this is an opportunity to turn this into 1971 or 2020 tops heritage yeah man I, I'm telling you just all that you had to change from here to here was the this this edge here and this suddenly is Put, make this black on the bottom and make the names white. I think you'd have had something. Yeah, that is that is so much better on the eyes. It, it, you can't fix the font on the team names. <laughs> That's like, I don't know what that is. Some kind of weird casino lettering or something. It's, ooh, it's rough. You got that? Okay, here's Rick Roden. Pitching, not golfing. Right. Yeah, Rick Roden, who's been a great golfer in his career. And the barrel hats were still around. In 86. That's a surprise. I didn't know they were still hanging out there. Well, 85 anyway. Yeah, right. Um, it was a crazy time in Pittsburgh, 1985. That's a story we can get into. <laughs> Rich Dower. And we move on now to some Braves. <laughs> Ow, my wrist. <laughs> Sorry. Instinctive reaction there. <laughs> Bob, Bob Horner in uh, a rarity. In fact, I think this card carries an extra premium because he's actually playing in a game. If you look carefully, that actually is a picture from 1981. Yeah. <laughs> the last time he played in a game. The Riverfront Stadium Turf, 1981. Bob Horner, by the way, for those who don't know, was famous for breaking his wrist a lot. <laughs> a lot. And not on a check swing. Yeah. Just <laughs> something he did. Did he go or not? No. Oh, he, he went on the injured list. Did not play in the minor leagues. Never won game. Not even on a rehab assignment. I don't. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Wonder if he always refused those. They're like, you got to do that at some point. I, I don't know where Richmond is. <laughs> Rafael Ramirez uh, has just either like spotted something on the other side of the field that he really likes or really hates. I can't decide, but that's quite a look. Ramirez part of the great double play combination with Glenn Hubbard. He probably saw teams like the Cardinals and the Giants and was saying, oh, I'd kind of like to be with them. And then he kind of saw like a reflection somewhere like, oh, I'm playing for the 80s Braves. <laughs> and, and when he left the Braves, he signed with the 80s Astros. <laughs> and not, not the 86 ones, the later ones. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a dude that didn't get a lot of wins in his career. <laughs> Poor Rafael Ramirez. Great, uh, you know, like for that era, for the Braves, he was, he was a guy. I mean, this is... This is your left side of the infield, third base and shortstop when he played. You mentioned that he went to another team that was not the most successful of its era. Did you know that he made the rare transition to basketball after his baseball career? I did not. He played for the Washington Generals. <laughs> That's a team that hasn't won much. And with that, we move on to pack number three right after this here on Baseball Card Illustrated. Every week, the Diamond King and I send out a batch of autograph requests to our cardboard heroes from the cards we find right here on the big show. We invite you to check out our previous episodes of Through the Mail Thursday, which are posted each week right around dinner time, to find out who will be the next to sign a card for us. Now, 
let's get back to 1986 tops to find out what cards we come up with and to figure out who we can send an autograph request to this week. Baseball card illustrated continues now that Kevin is done knocking plants over off camera. <laughs> or, or, as, or as we call it, Tuesday. <laughs> He's also trying to end up with the Astros instead of the Braves. I am the puppy Labrador retriever of life. Oh, we got a little bricking going on here. Hey, it's... card brick. Ha! Ah, look that, at that. That might actually be better than what's on the front of that card if that, you want to turn that around. That gum. The gum is attached on the back. It's a special error card for Tony Bernazard. Wow, that, that gum has literally bled through the card. I'm going to say that might be an improvement too. Spring, spring Fever Baseball. Here we go. Sammy Stewart. Wow, Sammy Stewart. That's a... Okay, so you want like the most obscure thing ever. Uh, he ended up with the Red Sox, Sammy Stewart did. Uh, the Red Sox made the World Series in 1986, and MTV did this series of kind of off-the-wall fun. They were trying to sort of show the lighter side of the players, and apparently Sammy Stewart was the jokester of the bunch. And uh, so Sammy Stewart ended up on MTV like a ton around the fall of 1986. They were, they were trying to show these guys, and he was, he was just this total nutcase. He was living in his element. <laughs> oh, Sammy. Jeffrey Leonard. How about a little one flap down? I was just about to say, what's the first thing you think of when you think about him? One flap down in the, jer in the crazy jersey. I was jersey. gonna say, you, is there a script somewhere that you took? Or <laughs> special powers on that plant that he knocked over to yeah. read minds? <laughs> yeah, Leonard with, it, with his, uh, it was double zero, right? Wasn't he mm -hmm. double zero? Yep. And uh, the one flap down home run didn't happen until 87, but he was contemplating it here in 86. <laughs> That's actually, you know what? That's a pretty good photo. That's a Roger Craig was like, "Hey, you know what you should do? <laughs> Hit the ball a mile, and then you can do a unique home run trot." Yes, you can hold a hold a wing out. <laughs> oh, sorry, Whoop. one flap, one flap down. I wonder what Terry Kennedy would think about one of his wow. players doing that. So, as you know, any vintage pack of cards, there's a litmus test. How bad are the Padres uniforms? I mean, you could do this for literally 20 or 30 years of the Padres history. And these are pretty muted. Here we got another Padres thing. That's the same guy. Doodly -doo, doodly -doo, doodly -doo. What's kind of curious is at one point the Padres did incorporate some blue into the whole look. They did. But that is really out of place oh, at this time. Yeah. I I think at that point you just make that black and just be done with it, you know, or or, or something. brown or something. Yeah, I'd change the Maybe change even the, the yellow would have stood out. This is um this is something though, because you're talking, you're really talking a couple of different eras of jerseys. Like this was, you know, used a little bit earlier, if I remember right, and that's a little bit later. But this not the same, not nearly the same as some of the other Padres uniforms at the time. That's not too bad. Tony Gwynn, very young Tony Gwynn, team leader in runs, team leader in hits. Steve Garvey led in a lot of categories too. But the leading home run hitter, Carmelo Martinez, with 21. Hmm. The Padres did not make the playoffs. <laughs> you know what I mean? Come on, baby, light my fire. So uh, that's third baseman, second baseman, Jim Morrison. That has to be an unfortunate name. Because when you're born, you don't know it's going to happen. What about Glenn Cook? Glenn Cook. Was he in the Eagles? Not, not Philadelphia. I was going to say, it, it, it's almost like we've got a uh, theme going here. Glenn but... Cook and... and uh, I don't know if Don you got Henley. any other uh, names here that work in this. Don, Don Henley, was that, a, was that a guy? How about a Roger Clemens rookie? Oh, wait, no. <laughs> that's not Roger Clemens, and it wouldn't have been a rookie anyway. <laughs> a little bit of Rick Cerrone there with the mustache. Oh, yeah. See, and, and if it's 80s and it's a mustache, it's an automatic win. That's that's mustache and wild hair, too. So this guy was on the beach some. He was, he was enjoying himself. Okay, we've talked about jerseys a little bit here, even in this uh, pack that we're on now. What about these Boston jerseys? I always thought that these look really cheap. They, yeah, they look a little bit like the Little League knockoffs, don't yeah. they? Yeah. It's like, oh, let's just take a plain gray jersey and put these kind of block letter things that almost look like you took some uh, electrical tape and just <laughs> made letters out of them. I wonder if it ties in, because here's the crazy thing about Fenway Park. It was old even then. And I wonder if maybe that was it. Like they're kind of going with a with a nineteen teens look to go with their nineteen teens ballpark. I'm gonna say like simple and gray has worked for the Yankees for years as a road jersey. Let's try to do that. But it, I yeah. just never cared for that look. Their white jerseys are fantastic. Let's see if we have any other red socks in this pack time. here. Nope. So here here's a look I always cared. 
or liked, cared for. Like nothing overly uh, complicated with it, but you know, you got the simple hat, you got the simple gray jersey with the Cincinnati Reds written or Cincinnati written on the front on yeah. the road. Um, I thought kind of were... a powerful look. Oh, oh. I, yeah, I thought you were just talking about the look he had. He just sort of concerned for the universe there. Um, Ted Power, a guy that we got an autograph from on our last edition of Through the Mail Thursday. How about that? Ted Ted Will to Power, because we were trying to come up with 80s groups. So, Ron Washington. <laughs> now, you could do something fun with Ron Washington. If you wanted, wanted to, you could have an in-action photo of Ron Washington running in place in a dugout. Because he did that when he was the Rangers manager. Actually, he's doing it right here. <laughs> go, 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 go. Doesn't really work, does it? <laughs> See, and those are the... Now, the Twins haven't gone to their late 80s look at this point. They still have the TC on the hat. That's a cool jersey. You've got the, the powder blue there. Like, again, I the two things that strike me, ugliest cards, prettiest uniforms. If you could put these photos on 87, I'd love that. Or 85. Yeah. Or any, anything. Any year. <laughs> So we've talked a little bit about the Braves over the course of uh, Baseball Card Illustrated and their struggles at the time, and I think this was an appropriately, na appropriately named manager, Bobby <laughs> Wine, because he probably needed a lot to get through managing the Braves at this time. Yeah, if you were if you were a Braves fan at this time, uh, you, Wine was a part of your routine, or it had to be to be able to watch the team. That was <laughs> that smile was because they're in spring training right there in West Palm Beach. He was probably not smiling by the time they got to April. I'm curious how many by, games... By May, he was W-H-I-N-E. <laughs> Why me? He uh, managed for f the 41 games for the Braves. That's how long he lasted. 41 games. And he probably thought that was 41 too many. <laughs> it's like, those 41 were the longest three years of my life. It's like, the good news is I get to manage. The bad news is it's not in the mi major leagues. It's with the Atlanta Braves. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we'll put him out of his misery and move on to this guy here, Don Ossie. That's uh, before David Ardsma. This was you know the alphabetical winner. You know if you were putting your cards in alphabetical order, this dude was always at the top. I say if I'm not mistaken, he was a pretty decent pitcher too. Like obviously the name kind of stu stood out when I was young, and that's what I remember him for. But he was around for a while. Yeah, huh? 162 ERA and 84 for the Angels mm -hmm. and. Then he won 10 games for the Orioles in 85. So, yeah, it's a, it's a valuable piece. You need a guy like that. I don't think this guy followed up with the same level of success. He was probably an average pitcher we got. Luis Blue Leal. Jays lefty. Luis Leal. Or I should say righty. Righty, Luis Leal. I don't know. Maybe he's fooling us. I, I, you know how sometimes you have the reverse negative on cards? John Littlefield. I, I had the reverse negative with my eyes. Was it John? It was Littlefield. Is his first name John in the 82 set where they flipped the, the card around? I was going to say, and that's happened a few times. I know Dale Murphy was a yeah. pretty famous one that reverse happened negative. in 1989. Wow, look at this. Luis Leal is Omar Minaya. No wonder he signed him later on. Hey! I don't know if he did, but it would make sense, right? Um, we'll get these guys off the uh, field here and make room for... We'll see Uribe. <laughs> Before Juan Uribe, there was Jose Uribe. You know what he's doing in that photo? It, it You don't see it too much these days. He's choking up on the back. Oh, he is. Look at that. That's <laughs> Kids, that's a thing that used to happen back in the 80s where to have greater back control, you would hold it just a little bit higher on the, uh, on the like back. Like Barry Bonds was famous for doing that. Uh -huh. um, nowadays, you see Joey Votto do it. That And those guys can hit the ball out of the park. Yeah. Yeah. Jose Uribe not hitting the ball out of the park. Well, look look at this. Set. On the disabled list, did not play, did not play, did not play, are the first four lines on his career stats. Oh, I would be curious to know because, okay, based on the birth date, he's an 18-year-old that first year on the disabled list and then doesn't play again until he's 22. I wonder what happened there. I'm going to say, did you uh, knock him over like your plant? <laughs> That's, the plant's going to spend three years on the uh, on the disabled list or, or out of baseball. I wonder what that's about. That's fascinating. We have to dig a little bit on that. I'm going to say, while you check that out, we'll move on to our last card here, and then we'll double back on that. Tom Brookins from the Tigers. There's He was the third baseman there for a long time. He was that. And, the, again, this is 
this is one of those timeless things. Even with the the bad writing there, with the Tigers logo on the or the Tigers and, and the light blue because you always associate that particular shade of blue with the Tigers. <laughs> That's this is you know classic Tom Brookins. That picture could be 1978, 1988, 1998 because it's clearly Tiger Stadium. I'm gonna say if there was anybody that looked, if you if you wanted to say who's a guy that looks like 1980s baseball, Tom Brookins would be about as good an option to go with as anybody. So the, the story about Uribe, real quick, signed by the Yankees in 1977, released shortly afterwards, did not play a game, it says on the disabled list, then signed with the Cardinals in 1980. That's, that's it. That's all there is. He was also, by the way, the ultimate player to be named later. He was involved in a five-player trade that brought Jack Clark to the Cardinals. Um, this, is, this is fantastic. He ch between the time of the initial trade and his delivery, he, he changed his name from Jose Gonzalez Uribe to just Jose Uribe because, as he put it, there are too many Gonzalez's in baseball. He said that. So he is the ultimate player to be named later because he was named differently after the trade. And, of course, there would go on to be several Uribes in baseball as well. <laughs> that's that's crazy. You know the, the 1990 Fleer Jose Uribe story. He's... Mm -hmm. been on eBay for half a million dollars and we don't really know why. Or do we know why? You it, might, I don't it, know. It's basically theorized that it's a money laundering scheme. <laughs> Jose Ribe, trying to make something happen. I guess so. So, in the spirit of uh, just renaming yourself, I think I'm going to now refer to you as the Diamond King. <laughs> that's my, that's my I, role? I think that's appropriate. I, I was calling you the rated rookie recently but i think the diamond king is a better fit so you can now be the diamond king in the... honor of our good friend here um jose gonzalez uribe <laughs> or anything else you would like to call him <laughs> and with that we'll uh, take a break and be right back here on baseball card illustrated with our final pack of 1986 tops fun is the name of the game here on baseball card illustrated sometimes the diamond king and i come up with valuable cards and iconic rookie stock and sometimes we have to make our own we invite you to take a moment to subscribe to the channel, give us a thumbs up, and leave a comment down below. We appreciate your support, and now take you back to 1986 Tops. 1986 Tops continues with Bronco, the PSA 11, and the Diamond King himself, Kevin. Kevin the Diamond King. I, that's a lot to live up to. I better not hurt myself. I'm going to say, or are you going to be the collector's choice? <laughs> I'm a little 1989 to, upper deck joke for you there. I'm just happy to not be a rated rookie. Because that means I've, I've gotten out of my first year. Well, this is unfortunate. We got a nice card here, I think. Maybe two. If I can unpeel it. Now, look at this. So we got a Hall of Famer oh. with, obviously, the gum stick to it, stuck to it, some powder and dust, and the front is wrecked, but it's Lee Smith. That is a 34-year-old piece of gum, and I'll bet you that tastes great. But that's it's interesting because you can literally see the stain right through the front of the card. Okay, you said it's a 34-year-old piece of gum. Now my question was going to be, how old is Lee Smith in this photo? Well, Lee Smith had been around for a while. He was he's probably, I'll say he was 30. Lee Smith was born in 1957, so if you assume this picture was taken in 1984, he would not have yet turned 34. Like 27, 28. So, Lee, oh my, that left an impression there. He's going to end up with the, the save king. So so Lee Smith, younger than that stick of gum, yes, currently is. Yes. So it, it, just so you know, everyone looking back to the old days of, oh, it was great when they included gum in cards. I'm going to flip this over and tell you that no, it was not. Oh, he's gone now. But anyway, it wasn't <laughs> better before he disappeared down there. You saw it for a second. <laughs> now there went that. <laughs> My attempt at trying to get the gum humor. out of there. Gary Maddox, center fielder, and that's, you know, for him, he's a little bit past where the, the Phillies were in their prime 80 World Series, 83 World Series, but he's we, still hanging around. Well, I gotta say, we talked about Jose Uribe reinventing himself. He did a much better job as a pitcher later in his <laughs> life for the Braves and the Cubs. See Maddox. The Dodgers, the Padres, and everybody else that Maddox pitched for. Paul Rungi. Is that the umpire? I, I think he is the son of the umpire, or... He's, I think he's related to the umpire. Okay. Yeah, it's it's interesting, but uh, he does exist. That's that has got to be a spring, or it's, maybe it's not a spring training photo. That's right. They had the chain link fences in uh, 
Atlanta, didn't they? I'm pretty sure that's that's a spring training photo only because uh, the Braves and Expos are, are playing and they shared a complex at the time oh, in West okay. Palm Beach. I think that's yeah, I think that's a March photo. You know, you'd make the joke which team would have drawn better at this time. Obviously, not the Braves, but the Expos drew pretty well for a lot of the time that they were in Montreal. In later later years, toward the end of the time that they existed or I shouldn't say existed before they moved to Washington, attendance kind of plummeted, but they drew pretty well at probably even still during this time because they were not that far removed from being a playoff team. Yeah, the things that people said were bad about Olympic Stadium later would not have been the case. Like Olympic Stadium would still have been kind of advanced in 1986. Like It wouldn't have been an eyesore. Uh, it's, it's a little bit of a haul from downtown to Olympic Stadium, but if the team's good... It's worth checking out. That's Hubie Brooks, by the way, sliding in there. And that's Hojo. Uh, yes. the, the, the man famous for his hotels and his big bat for the Mets. Hojo was, a, was an incredible hitter for several years. And then Omar Minaya <laughs> signed him and then unsigned him so he could sign him again. Yeah, that's a, <laughs> that's a, a Mets special. Oh, Hojo was, Hojo was a star. Okay, moving on to Moose Haas here, our first brewer of the packs here in 1986 tops. What strikes you about this card? Is, is it the same thing? And it's, I'm not even talking about the sweet powder blue uniforms. <laughs> Those are great. But I don't know how many pitchers warm up without a hat. Right. That's, that's the first thing that comes to mind. Maybe Moose knows that this is being taken for the top set, so he's going to show off that main. Maybe. I was hoping on the back, I don't know the answer to this. How did he get the nickname Moose? We'll have to find that one out. Moose Haas. That's a name. That's, an, that's a classic 80s brewer's name, but not in that Molitor Yacht way. <laughs> I'm going to say, we, we figured out why they called Pete Ladd Bigfoot on Through the Mail Thursday, <laughs> because he literally had big feet. But I don't think Moose Haas had like a moose in his yard or something. <laughs> so His father gave him that nickname when he was born. Uh, he was only seven and a quarter pounds, but apparently he looked to his uh, dad like he was going to be big. And as he says, Moose said, it didn't work out. So he was not quite as big as he thought. That is Brian Edmund Haas. Wow, I, I never knew that. There's your, there's your winner. 12-year big leaguer. I was going to try to do a Bullwinkle impression. It would have been pathetic. <laughs> so let's move on to uh, World Series hero Kirk Gibson. That's... I mean, doesn't that scream 1984 World Series right there? Tiger Stadium, very clearly Tiger Stadium. Uh, Motorcycles in the background. Yeah, well, it's, you know, <laughs> I, now you can drive one right through Tiger Stadium, I'm sure. Actually, you know, you know what it is now? It's actually a um, police baseball league. Is it really? Yeah, they, they've changed it into a league for kids, and huh. there's some condos around it. And it's it's kind of cool, it's actually. A, yeah, it's a complex. After a long time of them not knowing what they were going to do at the site, and it's standing vacant for a long time and really deteriorating. Now it's a place where you can play baseball again. So a real quick uh, reflection on the, on the era of baseball, because one thing about the 80s that was fantastic, other than the mustaches and the crazy hair, was, was the fact that you could have a team like the Tigers that could be just incredible. They, they, they could be great. The 80s were known for the Royals uh, winning a World Series and the Twins winning a World Series. These teams that would not be your normal normal guys. And of course the Tigers, uh, this was, where I'm going is this is the era before free agency was a huge, huge thing. I mean it existed. Free agency was there but it wasn't, you know any team could really still afford any player at that time. You can't say that anymore. $30 million a year that some of these uh, teams can't afford it. But back then, if you were willing to put the right team together, you could be good. And if you were the Tigers, you were great. Well, and you heard how Gibson ended up with the Dodgers eventually, didn't you? That was... Uh, kind of sort of related to maybe why some of the players were more affordable than they otherwise may have been. Yeah, collusion was a thing during free agency. And uh, any, the... The league eventually lost that suit, and some of those guys became free agents, including Kirk Gibson, who then went to L.A. And as a result, he moves, the Tigers, they move. Yeah, hasn't, well, hasn't they didn't been move, much for them. Now, here's a guy that you don't expect to see on this card with that up there. Wow, Mariners. Dave Henderson. And the thing is, Dave Henderson was responsible for one of the great memories of the 1986 season with the Red Sox. So clearly he had, you know, he'd swapped teams at that point, but... He was still a Mariner at this point. This, by the way, was my first 
Little League jersey, this exact jersey right here. Uh, not the 42, but the, but that, you know, that, that design, that whole thing with the stripe down the side. Uh, they didn't have, I got tall before I got big and they didn't have a jersey in my size. So when I, I'm not, this is not a lie. I got this Mariners jersey in Little League and I could still wear it like six years <laughs> later. Literally six years. It was in my, this, it was in my closet. My first throwback jersey. <laughs> Say, those are the best throwbacks, the ones that weren't actually throwbacks. <laughs> and then became throwbacks. They've been gone so long, they become a throwback. Johnny LeMaster. If you are a designer of a major league uniform, this is quintessential. This is vintage. The the uh, the Jolly Roger, the you know, the pirate on the jersey there, the barrel hat. I mean, you know his this dude's a Pittsburgh pirate. Like there's no question. Like you, could, you may you may not have known who he was, but yeah. you knew who he played for. That's right. Yeah, the, the the team is great. The player, not so much. Here's another guy. Ooh, that's one. That's a. If I'm playing words with friends, I just racked up the points right there. Let's see. That's a triple word score. <laughs> we'll move these guys out of here and move on to Brian Harper, who had a long career as a catcher for uh -huh. a number of different teams. So that so that's interesting because if you didn't know. You would think this was a different player because, first of all, he's a Cardinal and not a twin. Uh, also, it says he's an outfielder. So this is a guy that became a catcher. He was an outfielder and became a catcher. That's that's a shock to me. Would you believe that Johnny LeMaster played 13 years up to this point as we're looking at 1986 tops? He had 10 career game-winning RBIs. Wow. Yeah, that was a big stat in 1986. They were trying to put that on cards. He sold 39 bases for the 1983 Giants. Wow. That is more than most people will ever know about Johnny, Johnny LeMaster. You could win some trivia with that. And then they named a golf tournament after him. <laughs> Circle that! Green. Hey! Burt Blylevin. One of, my, one of the great stats, one of my favorite stats ever about Burt Blylevin is, and I think it was this year, 1986, he allowed 50 home runs in a year. So you've heard like a 50 homer players, right? <laughs> you know, as hitters. Like Cecil Fielder was a huge thing when he had 50 homers as he a hitter. He was chasing Maris at the time. <laughs> but the uh, Blylevin was trying to do it by giving up home runs. Yeah, 1986, get this. 1986, he allowed 50 home runs. In 1987, he allowed 46 home runs. So Blylevin was serving up the gopher balls, but uh, but he was still a, an extremely good pitcher. He threw 16 complete games. And he had a winning record in both those years. He allowed 96 homers and had two two seasons of winning records. I'm going to say a somewhat controversial Hall of <clears throat> Famer, but congratulations on getting in. He eventually got there. Close to the 300 win mark. That's one of the keys there. Now here's Johnny Grubb. I, I forgot that we've that's a card that we've sent out in the hopes of getting autographed, but I want to take a look here and point you in the direction of his glasses. And it seems like they actually got smaller, or I guess they couldn't get smaller in the past. They were smaller in 1984. Well, five than they would be in 1986 because we have a 1987 where the glasses almost look like they're somehow bigger than the hat going <laughs> through the brim of the hat. Like Harry Carey is looking at those glasses, yeah, like hey, like it, it's sort of hard to believe. Like somehow this thing was photoshopped, and you know we have some fun with the cards here, but we didn't do anything with that one. That was all him or all someone glasses. at the Tops company. So he just he wanted full peripheral vision with his glasses, so he got it. Johnny Grubb played for a long time and had 64 career home runs through 1985 as part of the Tigers. Whitey Here's Herzog. a card we have not come across yet. Whitey Herzog. Wow, the white rat. There he is. So he is, uh, you know, in, in, in this era right here, he is coming off of a World Series, and he's going to go back in 87 to a World Series. But 86 was, was not his year. But Whitey was, you know, you, you hear a lot about the Cardinals in, in of that era and how much they ran all the stolen bases and Vince Coleman cracking 100 all those years. And uh, I think Whitey was underrated because I think Whitey understood – when to let those guys run and when to, to meddle a little bit, when to hit and run, when to work some things, and how to get the best out of his pitchers. I see, obviously, a long, successful career in the dugout. And here's a guy, we, I think we can now add this to the board. <laughs> we got the Shotometer yes! himself. Put one on the Shotometer. So that's a, that's a great one, too, because you're talking pinstripe Cubs uniform and just, you know, young, you know, fresh faced Sean Dunstan. 
and this was a couple of years before he was terrorizing Mark Grace. Like it was, <laughs> it wasn't until 1988 that Dunstan was throwing his 120 mile an hour fastball from shortstop to first. I'm gonna say this might even be before they were thinking about moving him to become a pitcher. <laughs> Sean Dunstan. That's if you're, you know, the Cubs didn't didn't give the fans a ton. They did make the playoffs twice in the 80s, but they, you know, they, they didn't give them a ton beyond that. But Sean Dunstan was a highlight. You know, we we always show the Sean O'Meter and where we are with our subscriptions. And if you'd be so kind, please hit that button and subscribe. But the reason for that is Cubs fans at Wrigley Field in the bleachers would have the Sean O'Meter and they would track his batting average throughout the course of the season as it would range anywhere from the, what, 100s to occasionally he'd get up to the high 280s, yeah. 290s. He played for the Cubs the first time around for 11 seasons. And then for the last seven years of his career, he went Giants, Cubs, Pirates, Indians, Giants, Cardinals, Mets, Cardinals, Giants. Can you take a breath now? <laughs> That's a lot of teams in a fairly short amount of time. Yeah. No, the only team that he repeated two seasons were the last two with the Giants. I was going to say, he's one of those guys that will never make the Hall of Fame, will never have his jersey retired. But for the fan base of the team that he spent most of his career with, he's just a legendary, iconic guy. It's the truth. And was the number one overall pick, 1982. So there's a lot of hope, and, and he lived up to it. He's a good player. And I'll point out, it's not Sean. It's Shawan. Shawan Dunstan. And finally, that brings us, well, this is kind of a letdown, to <laughs> Kurt Young. No offense, Kurt Young. A's! And in case you're wondering, it says it right under. Hey, look, the, the A's on the top of the card is actually bigger than the giant A's on his hat. <laughs> How does that happen? And a different shade of green. Yes, very much. Well, as they went through the years, they got darker, right? Weren't they much lighter green? And then they finally got darker as it, uh, as it went? Well, as Kermit the Frog has taught us, it isn't easy being green. <laughs> and for the A's, they were still a few years away from anything being easy. It's a tough time for them. 86 tops. What a crazy, crazy issue because it doesn't look like anything before it or anything after it. Uh, and you know how tops now pays homage to old cards with new designs. Like there's a 2020 <laughs> tops Heritage that is 71. Can you imagine when they get to this? I don't think they're going to go back to that. They're going to have to find something else. I or think, maybe just make it all Opeachy or something. <laughs> that would be fun. I, I think by, by the time you get to about 75, right now they're, they're doing the 1971 design. By the time they get to 75, I think it might be time to find a different <laughs> way to go. Or just skip a thing somewhere yeah, along Yeah, go the back way. to 1950. Anyway, that's been a look at 1986 tops. So on behalf of Sparky Anderson, <laughs> Kirk Gibson... Uh. And the Sean O'Meter himself. Yes, indeed. I'm Bronco, the PSA 11. There he is, and you fell off already. Ow. You're injuring me. You're a pitcher, but you're swinging the bat. I just saw that. 68-mile-an-hour fastball. That's what a surgically repaired elbow will do for you. That's the Diamond King himself, Kevin. So long, everybody. You've been watching Baseball Card Illustrated.